Thank you all for, for joining. Um, so yeah, today we're going to start with the STAR project um, and then we'll have a little 10 minute break at about five to two. Um, and then after that break, come back and, and talk about the Meteor project. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Jess and Penn, who um, are both working on STAR with me, um, who are gonna introduce that project for you. All right, thank you so much for coming everyone. Um, you know, it's really good to see both some new and familiar faces uh, in this webinar today. Uh, we are really grateful to all of the people who have participated and helped us so much over the past few months as part of the STAR project, uh, which stands for Sustainable uh, and Transparent Research Data. Uh, and uh, the status of how universities across the UK are helping to make open research data uh, practices more of a norm in our sector. So my name is Pen Yuan Xin, you can just call me Pen. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bristol who has been very lucky to have uh, had a chance to speak to so many colleagues across the country who are doing amazing work uh, on this front. Um, uh, just do you want to just take a few seconds to introduce yourself as well? Hi, um, yep, I'm Jess Wheeler, and um, this is quite a new area for me. I, I've got a background in qualitative research, which is what's brought me into the project because it's a, a, a big interview project. Um, but I'm I'm new to the field of um, open research data, um, and learning lots every day. So it's it's been a really interesting um few weeks since I started and um, I'm looking forward to sharing where we've got to. Thank you, Jess. And I think all of you have uh, seen Russ just now. So huge thanks to Russ for their heroic effort, you know, being the project coordinator, uh, you know, bringing everything together. Okay, so STAR project. Uh, I think, you know, the whole thing actually started years ago with the Concordat on open research data that was published in 2016. Um, it was developed as uh, a, a collaboration between several organizations, you know, from some funders whose names have now changed, plus the Wellcome Trust, and very importantly, Universities UK, which represented you know, so many universities across the country, and they've all fed into a process to think about, you know, what open research data means, why it's important, and, uh, you know, this shared common desire to make open research data uh, a more common practice among academic researchers. So as part of that, they developed uh, 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 10 different principles underlying, you know, uh, uh, what can lead us to open data becoming more of a norm, ultimately with the goal to ensure that research data collected by our research community is openly available for use by other people whenever it can be done, right? Um, I won't go, uh, I won't enumerate all 10 principles right now, but it includes things such as acknowledging the right of the creators of that data uh, to, you know, uh, have reasonable first use of it, um, that data has to conform to existing legal and ethical frameworks, uh, or acknowledging that there is actually a cost to make, uh, not only publishing this data, but also to keep it available for people going forward. Um, just as a link to the actual concordat, which just can share in the Zoom chat right now. Uh, so you can look at, you know, the specific principles uh, if you want to learn more about them. Uh, uh, but the point is that, you know, these principles were described eight years ago and it's been, you know, a while. So why do we want to do the STAR project now? Well, we would love to learn uh, more about, uh, you know, the status of whether uh, higher education institutions have been able to implement these principles in real life. You know, what elements are more doable and which ones are more challenging to do, right? Uh, and a very important point is that uh, our goal isn't to use the Concordat on open research data to judge or to assess 
or to use as a measure for universities, but rather just uh, to give ourselves a bit of a guidance on some good principles and to um, to to see uh, not only how it is being implemented for the whole sector, but also you know how institutions. Uh, understand these principles, right? how they perceive it, and how it's relevant to the work that they do. And very importantly, you know, universities don't necessarily have to be associated with the, the concordat per se, uh, but it's just about, you know, how they reflect on some of these principles and how they approach it. Uh, of course, there's also another reason, which is the fact that uh, more and more funders uh, are starting to require, for example, at the very least, uh, research data management plans when academics apply for funding, or uh, the fact that there are, you know, big national exercises like the Research Excellence Framework, the RUF, uh, that at least in the past have required things such as open access publications. But looking forward, what does that landscape look like? And I think, you know, it's useful for us to understand the role of open data in that. Uh, and finally, actually, you know, we just like to um, uh, provide a, an opportunity for institutions to uh, uh, collaborate and learn from each other uh, through activities such as the webinar today, through the interviews we're doing, but also some workshops that are coming up for mutual learning and co-creation of uh, some outputs that we hope to share by the end of this year. And also to just celebrate, you know, the, all the progress and incredible efforts that uh, our colleagues at different universities have put into making uh, open data, you know, a real thing. Okay, so what are we actually doing for the STAR project? It actually started more than half a year ago when we worked with the Digital Curation Center to look at those Concorda principles, which are more abstract, and uh, derive 24 specific tasks that uh, are examples of things that um, universities are or could be doing to realize those principles. And after we've done that, uh, the meat of uh, a lot of what we're doing for STAR is that we have been conducting semi-structured interviews uh, with up to now, you know, 33 individual participants from 19 different uh, universities across the country. Uh, and we didn't limit uh, the specific type of role that people play in their universities when it comes to developing and implementing open data practices. But in practice, what's happened a lot is that these people typically uh, are part of their university libraries, uh, part of their university research services, uh, uh, which make up, you know, most of the people that we've talked to. But there are also some other cases such as, you know, we've been really lucky to talk to research directors, you know, PVCs of research, for example, among other things. But they're mostly people based in libraries or research services. As for the institutions, what was really, really important to us was that uh, we really don't want to limit ourselves to the universities who are the big names, you know, the really huge research intensive universities, as important as they are, we really want to expand uh, to, you know, the people we reach to, to really represent a good diversity of universities in the country. So we've talked to people from very different geographical areas across all of the UK. Uh, people who have very different levels of funding, including different levels of, you know, QR funding, for instance, uh, and also uh, universities who focus on very, very different fields of research. You know, it could be a medical university, it could be an arts-based university, it could be universities who have faculties covering different disciplines, right? But we really want to have these different axes of diversity represented in these universities. So um, one thing I want to do now is to start talking about some of the things we have learned from these incredibly illuminating conversations. And again, I'm so grateful uh, 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 you know, to all of the people who gave us their time to do these interviews. And one thing I want to say uh, uh, to start off with 
is that a lot of these open data, you know, people are what you know we're calling kind of these architects and builders who are you know putting up a lot of not only the technical but also the organizational and institutional infrastructure to make open data practices uh, possible in their institutions that are relevant to them, right? And uh, even though these people are, you know, typically uh, sit in libraries or research services, it's not limited to that, uh, but they're typically almost always people who are in their universities kind of professional services uh, who have to take on a lot of the work to work with institutional leaders who make a lot of decisions, they have to engage in those conversations, and they have to take on a lot of the burden to come up with those policies, or at least update existing policies to reflect the state of the art when it comes to open research data. Uh, it's also interesting that they have different levels of influence in that process, depending you know, on uh, the level to which their institutional leaders are receptive to uh, open data concepts. Uh, they also have to work very closely with their research and teaching community uh, uh, who uh, are very diverse, you know, uh, whether it's on the departmental school or faculty level. Um, uh, there's great diversity in the disciplines and subjects and vocations, you know, of their research and teaching community. Uh, there are, you know, some communities who do research all the time, some mix between research and teaching, some academics who spend most of their time on teaching, who might not have thought about, you know, data as a thing very often. And there's a lot of complexity there that these architects and builders we've spoken to have to navigate, you know, and, 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 and find effective ways of working with. So I think the point is that um, these people sit in a fairly distinctive location and, and that's the thing I really want to drive across, right? Where they sit in their organization. So, um, so that's something we've learned. And, um, and, and that's what we would like to call, you know, these people that we've spoken to. And, you know, they've put in so much effort and they have made some progress. I just want to give you a quick examples just now. And then, uh, uh, and then we'll, we can expand on them um, afterwards. One is that the Concordat on Open Research Data uh, has influenced a lot of these uh, data-related policies at different universities. Now, the interesting thing, and I think the important thing, is that uh, the influence might not always be explicit or direct. Uh, for instance, there are some you know, of these architects and builders in universities where uh, uh, they developed their institutional policies for data, but maybe they didn't explicitly reference the Concordat, uh, um, you know, or even refer to the Concordat in their policies. But even in the language of their policies, you can see that it actually maps to the Concordat in many different ways. Um, and also, you know, sometimes when they do refer to the Concordat, you know, their universities might not be officially a signatory to the Concordat, which is something that some universities have done. So I think this is interesting because uh, on one hand, the Concordat was important and influential starting from eight years ago. But, you know, when it comes to what universities do for their policies, um, uh, I think, you know, there is this awareness among them that, you know, to the extent that they don't necessarily always need to record, uh, refer to the Concordat explicitly. Uh, and again, you can see that in the language of the policies. Uh, the other big thing that's happened, especially over the past few years, is that a lot of technical infrastructure is falling into place uh, when it comes to making it possible, at least, for academics in these universities to share open research data, should they choose to do it. And that is a big if, because, you know, again, some researchers don't necessarily, you know, think about their work as something that produces data or that it needs to be shared. Uh, another huge thing is that, is, again, especially over the past several years, um, uh, these architects and builders have developed a lot of training and 
treatment and kind of informational work that they provide to their academic communities so that if they choose to think about data and want to share it, uh, a lot of support is available for these um, uh, uh, for these uh, uh, academics. And one interesting thing I will quickly say on this is that very often this kind of training or uh, education uh, uh, works well for people earlier in their careers, even including uh, postgraduate researchers on the master's and PhD levels. Uh, qualitatively, some of the people have told us that it seems to be easier to get take up from that group of people. Uh, another interesting thing is that for more teaching focused universities, uh, it is easier for these architects and builders to kind of, you know, put open data training into the PGR kind of education process because it's pitched as a teaching thing. Uh, just really quickly, some challenges. One is what we're calling translation work. This is a huge thing because, um, you know, data as a word, and but also as an epistemic concept uh, is, is something that, you know, that's really re receptive and natural to some fields of research, but pretty foreign to others, right? So let's say, you know, we have a history researcher, you know, they might not think of data as a thing that's part of their research at all. And, uh, or someone, you know, who does performative art, you know, what does data mean to them? And this is a challenge a lot of the architects and builders have to face. And this is something we're gonna come back to. Uh, small, you know, versus large institutions have very different levels of capacity when it comes to the extent to which they can develop and implement open data practices. Uh, uh, and the challenges they face can also be very different. For a huge institution, it might be very difficult for them to even know what their research community is doing when it comes to data. Now, interestingly, for smaller institutions with fewer staff and fewer academics, on one hand, they're challenged with having far fewer resources to do that work. But on the other hand, sometimes their academic communities are small enough that they can actually, you know, stay in touch individually with researchers and provide custom and personalized support. So there are some interesting thing, things going on there. But regardless of their situation, monitoring is something that is consistently very difficult for almost everyone we've talked to to do. Uh, you know, how do we know the status of who's sharing what and where, right? And how do we figure out that big picture for where our university is? That has consistently been very hard from uh, almost everyone we've talked to so far. Now, these are a few, but, you know, kind of a few quick things uh, uh, that we're hearing, but they are very consistent from the interviews that we have done. Now, uh, what's also really important is that underlying these things are actually some common patterns and narratives uh, that we ha are hearing from the journey these people are making uh, along the way to uh, open research data practices. And for that, I am going to hand it off to Jess. Thank you, Pan. Um, yeah, so we've been trying to, I think what Pen's presented to you there is a kind of descriptive account of what people have been saying and, and some of the headlines in terms of uh, the progress and the challenges. And we've been trying to make some sense of that to characterize that data in a way that can help us to understand some of the patterns and a bit more about what's important. What do we need, what do we need to know to, to make the next steps in, in a way that's helpful? What can we learn some useful things from this, from these interviews beyond a descriptive account? Um so I've been oh Pen, the um slides aren't letting me move. Oh yeah, okay, I'm moving. <laughs> Was that you or me? Me, great. Okay, so <laughs> we've been thinking about this journey um, as if it were a game board, um, and we could imagine the start of this game. We're not. We're not going right back to the beginning. We're not. At, you know. We're not conceiving the notion of open research data. We're starting at the point where some work has already been done. Some work with some big sector players has been done, trying to think about how to bring about. Uh, uh, an open research data conducive environment. Um, and that has generated the Concordat principles. And, and of course, those Concordat principles sit within 
uh, the sector uh, among, uh, they have a common language in, in the sense that they are derived from a, a whole load of work beyond the Concordat around open research data and, and how that might be generated and conceived of and brought about. Um, so here we have these Concordat principles and we're treating that as our starting point. And we're, we're looking to see where everyone has got to on this game board. Um, it, imagining an endpoint where we have realized open research data. Um, and actually that endpoint is negotiable. That that could have, we could have many different visions of, of that reality. Um, but I just want you to think a little bit about the, the, the institution for a second and imagine the different groups that Penn characterized earlier um, that, that are sort of present within the institution when we talk about open research data and who it impacts on and who does it and what the work involved is and who's setting it up. And we've got these um, professional services, the, the librarians or the research uh, uh, services. Um, I'm characterizing them here in, in red. Um, and within that, we have perhaps an open research data team. And that's the little meeple. So we've got a big meeple and a little meeple. We've got the big professional services and we've got the, the little. And, and that big includes IT and libraries and, and research and enterprise and commercialization, all sorts of professional services within the institution. And then there's that little uh, meeple, which is the open data research team, or it may just be an open data research person. And that, that person um, or team has often been brought into the institution because they have a background of experience or interest in open research data. So they are actually way ahead on this game board. They are at a point where they, uh, they, they, they don't just get open research data, but they've been working in a field where they've maybe um, been realizing open research data, either in terms of their work with repositories or um, their, their work in, in implementation roles. So they're, they're much further ahead, perhaps, than the rest of the, the group in, in professional services. And then we've got in blue the disciplines, the, the research and teaching. And those little meeples are all the different um, disciplines um, that you might have within an institution. So some institutions might be very focused on, on one or two of those. Another institution might have lots of them. And those disciplines are all moving in very different paces around this board. Um, and then if we imagine in green, the institutional leaders and the little meeple there is the, the kind of PVCR. There's a few people within the institutional leadership roles who are very engaged in research, research data, meta data, that they have a they have a different conception and are much further around this board. So I'm just going to rest that there. If, if you think about there are different players in this, when we think about the institution, it's not one thing. It, it has many parts. Oops, okay, I need to accept there's a small delay on my slide moving. So this is just one uh, University of Cape Town uh, open research data team uh, conceptualization of, of the benefits of uh, an open research data environment. And so we could imagine these kinds of benefits in a world where we have realized our open research data, we would be gaining already from the quality and integrity, the economic benefits, the global benefits, the public disclosure and engagement, innovation, efficiency, these things would all be manifest. Um, in an environment where we've realized our open data values. This could be our endpoint. We could imagine this as an endpoint. Um, and if we think about Brian Nozek's uh, strategy for culture change version um, of um, how do we get there? How do we get to a place where we are at this endpoint of open research data being realized? Um, he conceived of it as something that would have this kind of bottom up structure, in infrastructure building, user interface and experience that would make it easy. So it become possible, it becomes easy. There's, there's uh, the technologies there, the repositories, the communities start to use it and it becomes normative. It becomes inherently rewarding. Um, and then the policy makes it required. So this is a version of that journey. And we certainly um, thought about that when we, um, uh, we're constructing interview questions um, and, and within interviews. Um, that doesn't mean this shape holds and we certainly haven't found the triangle to hold. It, it could be that this triangle fits perhaps more with the, within disciplines and their movement in open research data and perhaps less within institutions, but I'll come back to that. Um, what we've found when we look at this journey is it's more like we've got rounds, we've got a horizon and that horizon comes into view as you go along the journey and across the board, whether it's small or big institutions, institutions focused in one disciplinary area um, or multiple, um, 
where we're starting um, from these principles, we're moving in the institutional uh, game board um, to policies and infrastructure. So most, most of the institutions we've spoken to, most people have got now in place policies. They have been written some time ago, they're being reviewed or they're being rewritten or they've been written for the first time, but the policies are there. They've been uh, seen by leadership and accepted by leadership and they're pushing on open doors with these policies. They're, they're, they are accepted, wanted, welcomed. Um, and the infrastructures are being put in place, have been put in place to, to make it possible. So um, people are talking about Figshare, they're talking about their own repositories. Um, the institutions are now holding um, the technological means and, and providing um, support for research um, communities to, to make their data openly accessible. Um, but that doesn't mean we're at round two uh, in, in a in a really strong way. We've got to the point now where there's training and there's support to enable uptake. So that's definitely something that we're seeing across the board. Um, but in terms of those getting to the end of round two where you have established open data practices, nobody is saying that that's the case. They're saying that it's a very uneven pattern, that those little meeples in the different disciplines um, mean that open research data is not happening across the board. And even within um, disciplines where there is much more movement, um, that doesn't mean that there's connection with the institutional infrastructures of open research data. It might be a proportion of the research community that's really engaged. Um, and so this is not something which is uh, totally uh, normative or familiar to people. It's it, there's There's some work to be done in terms of this being something that is just part of the culture. Um, and certainly in terms of round three, if we think of it in that way, um, in terms of realizing those open research data values um, and monitoring the use and uptake, the use of repositories and also the, um, the use of the openly available, openly accessible research data, that's not happening yet. It, it's actually quite hard for institutions to conceive of how they are going to put in place um, meaningful processes that will evaluate across the disciplines, across across their, their communities. Um, although, as Penn mentioned, in smaller institutions, that feels perhaps more possible in the sense that um, the research community is smaller and better known. There are more points of contact with individual researchers um, between the researchers and the open research data teams. Um, and and it, it is possible for them to actually go to each individual and, and see how they're doing and what they're doing and how much of their work has been made openly accessible. Um, so, so smaller institutions may be advantaged in terms of their uh, ability to monitor, but that doesn't mean we're in this place where all the disciplines and all the researchers are using open research data or are wanting to put their, their, their data into open research repositories. So when we think about this again, just it, it's the same um, rounds, but we can understand that first round as a compliance round. And actually um, within the institutions, it seems like, um, it's compliance which is pushing this. The, the, the driver of open research data is, is coming from the point of policies and uh, requirements that people will say things like it's a tick box exercise. People are doing it because they have to. They have to, to get published, to get their paper in a particular kind of journal. They have to say that they've made this data openly accessible. That's when they come to me. We're talking about the next ref as something which will likely require us to do these things. And so we are using that as a, as a way of, of pushing the university's policy. So there's this kind of compliance level push at the round that we're looking at. Um, and in terms of normalization, that's very different if you are in a discipline which is really advanced with this stuff, where actually people in your community are using open research, um, open open research data repositories within disciplines. It's it's normalized. There's funding for it. There's big consortiums. There's a, a huge inherent value is already perceived. Um, there it's normal within disciplines, but within the institution, that's not the case. And in terms of it being deeply embedded, it's just something that is valued and that is done and that is part of the culture. We're quite far from that. And there are some, that, that has some implications. And just going back to Nozex uh, uh, triangle, well, we don't have a triangle anymore. We've got some kind of shape. We're not sure what it is yet, but he had policy right at the top of that, but we've got policy right at the bottom, if you like. It, that the university is driving open research data change through policy and, and also infrastructure. So it's going from top to bottom. Um, 
is it easy? Well, yes, I think that they're, they're working really hard to make the um, machinery of open research data repositories accessible and usable and supported with training and with people who are at hand to, to help. Um, but there's a, an ease which comes through familiarity and familiarity that comes through your peers also using it. And that's just not yet there yet. It's too small a numbers of the people, the community, the whole community that are doing it to make it familiar. And that's, you know, in terms of this normative and rewardingness. Um, again, um, we're hitting some barriers. So I'm just going to talk really briefly about the barriers um, and what that means for us. So I've I've mentioned this idea of uh, the the technical unfamiliarity and, and limited exposure. So it's not about the ease of of the of of the the machinery. It's about the exposure. Um, and so we could expect a slow gain on that as people start to 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 do more of it. Um, so in a sense, that's not the toughest barrier. Um, but if we move on to the normative, we've got a set of um, what sometimes get maybe uh, meanly called excuses um, and, and at other times, I think, more considerately called concerns, um, which are things like um, commercialization, the sensitivity of data. These are uh, concerns which are definitely addressable they are things that the open research um, sector has has been very able to um, argue um, uh, to say that there are ways of doing commercialization and there's ways of addressing sensitivity that, that can certainly favor us still making our data open openly available but that doesn't mean that those concerns are being addressed uh, helpfully or vocally or, or in ways that are supportive to the research community within the institution um, so it may be that the open research data team or the open research data person would would make that case helpfully and strongly and sensitively. Um, but the commercial team, we don't know whether they would also uh, support someone who's going through a commercialization process to also make their data openly available so that then there may be work to be done to address those challenges and concerns. And then there's a whole other I think much harder set of challenges and concerns in terms of the research culture. Um, which are getting in the way of, of this becoming normalized. Um, and those are much more to do with the workload that research and teaching communities experience and the fact that open research data is not yet understood as an economic uh, entity that gets priced into um, research applications. So we've heard, for instance, of researchers putting uh, a really tiny amount of money um, to the notion of their repository, you know, this data, we would like it to go onto a, an openly accessible repository. And we've got 200 pounds for that. But actually with the open research data team in checking out the, the, the reality of that two terabytes of data being stored for the next 20 years is saying it's more like 20,000. And that's a big, there's a big reality check there and some big questions around how much data do we want to be storing and how much, what quality of data do we want to be storing? Um, and, and I think in the impetus to encourage people to make their open research data, uh, the, the, their data openly available, um, there's there's been a lot of push on, don't worry about the quality, we just want it to be accessible. But actually, in reality, there are some pushbacks and in, in terms of limitations, costs, data limits, you know, the actual size of data repositories and how much they can take. Um, that that really needed to be thought more about so that um, grants can can uh, accommodate those um, costs more appropriately um, and so that universities can also fund in people's time to, to put stuff onto repositories. Um, so these kinds of issues, there are many of those and, and different, different specifics. Um, and that just leads to that final point of in terms of it being rewarding um, and what's the barriers that are around that. Um, at the moment, when we look at the institutional drivers that are coming from this compliance perspective, um, the drivers might be things like REF, which people talk about. Yeah, we, it, it's helpful if the REF changes to make it more required um, and funders and journal requirements. Um, but these are, are quite a, a heavy hammering tool um, where disciplines may not yet be ready or wanting or needing um, this infrastructure to be in place. Um, and so it's quite different from uh, a driving force which is coming from the perceived worth and merit. So within disciplines, that seems to be much more clearly the case. And those that are very advanced and are much further around that 
that game board and are in round three and are realizing their open research data culture, um, it's come from that perceived worth. They've not needed the, the ref and the funding general requirements. Um, so maybe we need to be careful how far we go down this compliance road. And also it's an uncomfortable position for the open research data team, the professional services, perhaps also the university leadership to be pushing on the research and teaching community um, from a compliance uh, approach. Um, and, and, and there is a sensitivity to that that we are hearing in, in the interviews that we've done. So I'm gonna hand over back over to Penn, who's gonna talk about um, some ideas for the future, how we might address some of these challenges. What, what, what would we, where would we go from these thoughts? All right, thank you, Jess. Uh, that was great. So um, uh, just for the uh, shorter part at the end here, I, uh, I wanna talk about some of our reflections, you know, based on everything we've heard. Uh, and, and what we think, you know, uh, uh, might be some ways of looking forward in, in terms of what we, uh, you know, maybe should do as a as a sector to uh, address some of the barriers and challenges, but also to help, you know, make open uh, data practices more more of a accepted norm. Um, so the first one is that uh, support for these architects and builders we've spoken to. Uh, will be really important. Uh, but there are several different uh, meanings of this. What I mean is that on one hand, you know, for the individuals, right, the open data, uh, uh, um, the open data officer with a team, uh, you know, in a university, sometimes it's just one person, you know, being that team for the whole university. Sometimes it could be a dozen people. But these teams, they uh, they do have this distinctive role. And they often sit in relatively remote uh, uh, positions within the wider organizational structure. And how do we uh, support the work that they do is an important question. And the support could be so many different things. You know, funding is obviously a big one, but other things would include, you know, for the research that happens in the university, um, you know, uh, are there, for example, good cases of data reuse that they could use in their engagement and outreach and teaching? Or, uh, uh, or you know, how do we support them in terms of all of this uh, trickling up they have to do, right, to advocate for open data to whether it's the, you know, leadership in their university or their wider research uh, academic communities? You know, um, because they have varying levels of influence within that institution, and sometimes that can be really challenging, right? So we don't want, you know, all of these people doing such important work to become disheartened, you know, and uh, and 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 discouraged from doing the important work that they do, right? And moving up a bit, you know, how do we uh, look at the wider organization of their institutions? when some of them might not be aware of or on board with open data and what are some of the tensions there for instance when you interact with you know commercialization and enterprise services in your university you know what are the implications there right that's one level but on the sector level uh, uh we believe there can also be better peer support specifically about data and open data uh whether it's from better resourced institutions you know, supporting other institutions uh, or sector-wide, you know, networks uh, providing that collaboration and knowledge sharing that could be so helpful uh, and all of that. The other big thing is, of course, the different levers for change uh, that are essentially the sticks that Jess has talked about so much. You know, uh, almost every single person we've talked to, you know, refers to the previous roughs as uh, a blunt tool that can, on one hand, really move things forward. And, uh, you know, it's motivated things such as all the effort that's been put into open access papers. Uh, but beyond the rough, you know, uh, what are funders' roles in this, what journals' roles? And this comes back to another really important point that I just touched on, which is, you know, right now, for instance, uh, when an academic is applying for funding, uh, some funders might actually require you to have a data management plan in your grant application. But 
you know, you might do that initial work and you might even work with the data support team at your university to write a data management plan and you get your funding. But what happens after that, you know? Um, uh, do you actually publish your data? Do you get the support you need to do that, right? So we could see that in, you know, a funding application, it might be better or useful to include, you know, dedicated funding to support, let's say, a 0.5 FTE person on your project team who is the data management person uh, to enable a lot of these practices. Or maybe, you know, in your budget for your grant application, it includes, you know, the budget you need to publish and sustain your data to keep it available for the next 20 years. But uh, is this something that the funders are aware of and would encourage for you to include in your funding applications, right? Uh, so, you know, that, that's another thing. So how do we actually uh, make, you know, open data expectations consistent across all of these different levers and sticks, actually? And again, coming back to the point that effective monitoring is a challenge that's faced by almost every institution that we've talked to so far. You know, very often these architects and builders, their main contact point with their academic community is when they make their funding applications and only when the funders require them to include a data management plan. But what happens after that? You know, for most of the people we talk to, um, they're really challenged in uh, following through in terms of seeing whether data has actually been published in a rigorous way. You know, is the data being used? Could that be good examples to share and to use in our communications to advocate for open data? Uh, so that kind of follow through is a big challenge as well. Uh, and how do we do effectively monitor and get the big picture of open data practices for a university is a big challenge. So that's something we see that needs a lot of you know, work between all of us to make happen. Uh, now, something that's really important that we're seeing and certainly very important to me <laughs> is that underneath all of this, it comes back to the translation work that so many of these architects and builders have told us about, right? So, um, you know, what does open data mean to some fields of research? You know, let's say there's a medievalist you know, who travels to across the world to a particular, you know, physical archive to look at a particular physical artifact from 500 years ago to inform their research. You know, what does data mean in this case? Now, you know, on one hand, you could say that in this case, that physical item is the data on which they base their assertions in their research. Sure, that's fine. But one thing is that, you know, why do we even need to call that thing data? You know, some people have said, hey, you know, data, you know, is a concept that comes from a lot of scientific research. So why, you know, do you have to shoehorn that concept onto the research that I do as a medievalist? Uh, but even if we choose to use uh, 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 data as the concept here, you know, another big thing is that, you know, touching on all of these three points I mentioned, let's say that we do, you know, require a lot of open data practices. For example, we say, you know, whether it's in the REV or in your funder requirement that a researcher has to deposit, you know, their digital data in an online repository somewhere, right? But again, why is that useful to that medievalist who has to travel across the world to that physical collection and look at that one physical item? You know, requiring them to deposit some form of digital data might not even be meaningful or useful for the research that they do, even if we call it data. You know, in that case, we might be adding unnecessary and extraneous work for them when that's not useful for them. Maybe the more important thing is to ensure that physical archives and that material is well cared for, well funded and well supported and accessible for researchers who want to do that research, right? Or, you know, what does all of this even mean for let's say a researcher who does performative art, for instance. So there's a lot of complexity here. And I think my point is that it is so important for the epistemic 
diversity of diverse research to be represented and have their voices heard in you know the policy setting and if we do get to the point of designing sticks are those sticks representative of that diversity so these are just some of the messages uh, that we're hearing um there's a lot more that we hope uh, to do in our reporting and also through the workshops that we plan to do to engage further with our participants uh, throughout the rest of the year i just want to end by first of all thanking the funding institutions that have enabled the star project to have gotten us to where we are right now we're really grateful of course for their support i hope what we're doing is useful for them uh of course, you know, we want to thank all of the participants to this webinar today. But most importantly, I just want to heap, you know, all of my thanks and praise to all of those individual architects and builders from these almost 20 universities who are so busy, you know, doing the important and valuable and heroic work that they do to enable open data and for their incredible generosity in giving us so much of their time to teach us about their experience that we're trying to summarize and hopefully provide and feedback to the rest of the sector in a useful way in our deliverables at the end of the year. So thank you so much for your generosity and your patience. Um, so this is what we would like to share today. The one thing I will end with now is that informally we would love to hear from you all of us in the uh in, in in this webinar today um you know one question we have for you is you know what's your take-home message from everything you've heard in this web webinar about star and very importantly what do you think we have missed you know are there gaps in what we shared for you today are there things we should really think about or study you know uh so we would love to hear from you about that so just to make it really simple if you want to talk about that just refer to these two points and just type into the Zoom chat, you know, and we would love to hear from you. Thank you so much. And just to add to that, we'd also welcome questions. That was just, it would be nice to have some um, uh, quick written feedback in the chat on those two. Uh, what did we miss and what did you take home from that? But if there's any questions, we'd love to hear them. Yes, please speak up. We would love to hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, you can unmute and ask it or, or type it in the chat and, and I can pass on to, to Jess and Penn. I'll give you a, a minute or so to get them down. I'll start with what with one to, to, to get us going. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a lot about kind of the the barriers that, that are being faced um, by people in these these open data roles. Have you seen any kind of examples of collaboration or where kind of different institutions have worked together to try and um, kind of get over these? Uh, thank you, Russ. That's a great question, actually. So. Uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, I think we have spoken to people from a few institutions where when they're developing po developing policies, sometimes either they are informed by their prior work at other institutions um, doing similar roles, or uh, what sometimes happens is that one thing we hear is that there is some level of informal communication between counterparts at different institutions. So sometimes, you know, they would have these kind of informal conversations when developing policy. But uh, my sense is that uh, there isn't a lot of kind of formal kind of networking around developing uh, data policies. Thanks. We've got... <laughs> yeah, Sorry, I, I think we're seeing some questions in the chat as well. Yeah. So I was going to um, start on the first from Tom Hosler. Thank you. Um, were any open data policies developed with the specific involvement of researchers and academics to help with translation issues? Um, yes, very, very much so. Um, uh, the open data research teams uh, definitely had committees that were led by research um, uh, academics um and and so they, the, that was definitely part of their culture is 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 not to be um 
just pushing stuff onto people but to be drawing from the community and, and moving with the community of, of uh, researchers and teachers um, but that doesn't mean that the end result of those policies would have permeated through the entire research and teaching community it might be a few figureheads who um, are, get very involved in these processes but once <clears throat> But the, but the policies and, and the compliance issues are then relevant to everyone in ways that the others might not have been quite ready for or or, or might need some work still to get on board with. Did mm -hmm. you want to? Um... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jess. Uh, in, uh, just in the interest of time, I think you answered that really well, Jess. I'm going to move on to the next question. Great. Sarah, thank you, Sarah, for your question. Were there any common training background in those who are doing the work? Great question. So uh, first of all, very often uh, the people we talk to, they do come from a library kind of degree background. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, a lot of them also come from academic research backgrounds. They were academics themselves who, for one reason or another, they are passionate on a values and principles level about enabling not just open data, but also open research. So they actually moved into these roles to help their institutions you know, adopt uh, these behaviors and help change their culture. If that makes sense. So they were interested. Sorry, it depends. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, they have had some really interesting backgrounds in terms of they were often real champions of open research data. And that was part of, you know, they came into these roles really keen to see change and be part of bringing about change. And so it's interesting to, to have the real generators of change in, in a way, the ones who are really helping to write the policy and bring in the infrastructures also located not in positions where they have huge amounts of power. Um, so they, but 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 yes, definitely situated in li in library services and often having librarian backgrounds as well, but not always. And and like Penn said, often diverse backgrounds. So an interesting bunch, which is why we think that support and peer support for those people could be really important because it could be quite um, uh, demoralizing being in a slow process when you're quite ahead of it and and being quite a small group within that within within mm -hmm. the big institution. Absolutely. Yeah. And I want to quickly uh, touch on, you know, that great point made by Sally in the chat, you know, about uh, a practical issue, which is that sometimes researchers at the end of their project, they actually want to share their data. But turns out, if you look back to the consent and ethics kind of paperwork they did at the beginning of the project, turns out that, you know, they set themselves up to not be able to share the data, if I'm understanding uh, Sally's uh, comment correctly. So they're working on updating university templates right, you know, in collaboration with ethics and governance teams to make sure that, hey, maybe at the kind of uh, initial stages of uh, getting ethical approval and getting consent forms for, for relevant research, you know, they think about open data. And that's a great point because for some of the people we've spoken to, one way they're getting people to think about data is that maybe in their university, most of their researchers require ethical approval for the work they do. So they actually use that as an engagement point where in the ethical approval process, uh, procedurally, they get their researchers to think about the data side of things and even encourage them to share data uh, to the extent that it can be done. So that's a great point. Thank you. And and just to add to that, it's also become a tool of monitoring the, the ethics process, having a box around open uh, research data and open access following the project now means that there's a way to um, tag those projects. So um, ethics is definitely having a, an interesting role in relation to um, ways in to talking about open research data and to starting to make plans and also um, to monitoring the use or, or, or of the repositories. Indeed. Uh, I think we might have another question there somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah. So we've got, we've got a question from Sarah saying, are funders recognizing that if they require data to be open, there's a cost for it um, and setting aside money for that? Oh, great question. Yeah. So, uh, I think there might be a little bit of unevenness in there, but one concern that we have certainly seen from you know people in these universities is that not all funders are quite aware of the full extent of how of the cost that it takes to make open data sustainable over the long term. Right again, it comes to my point earlier where 
uh, okay, let's say me as a grant applicant, you know, I ask for a, a particular chunk of funding in my application because I want to fund, first of all, a data person in my team, but also to pay for long-term archiving. Not all funders will fully appreciate this, and that might actually become, you know, something that counts against me in my funding because I'm actually asking for more funding. So I, at least on a qualitative level, I think there is uh, this much needed awareness and understanding that needs to be built around funders to make this more consistent among them, right? And just to add to that, a sense of a need for some economic costings so that it's easier to describe how much it will cost to, to to quantify the amount of data you're going to need and to quantify the timeline for the need of that the the, the requirement for storage of that data um, and then to have a sense of also the time it will take to get it into the depository the repository rather to deposit it and the um the the, the long-term costs around storing it so I think all of that stuff could do with some more um nuts and bolts sense of costings um that I'm not sure if uh, the finance services are yet able to do. I mean, that's that that's a little barrier that might have some quite big implications. Yeah, that's a great point, right? So we we might have a good idea of knowing how to cost, you know, someone on a 0.75 FTE for two years, but for a lot of universities in the wider sector, we might not have a sense of you know how to cost for X amount of data for the next twenty years in a particular repository. You know, so I think that's something worth uh, developing for sure. So I think one last quick question before we go for a break. Um, Adam has said, speaking of peer support, are there any existing communities of practice for these architects or are there any plans to create one? Yes. Um, so I think people are referring to peer communities, but actually... Um, <sighs> they really welcomed the interviews because it was a chance to talk through the things that they don't often get a chance to talk through. And that I think speaks to the fact that there aren't very um, well-established forums for these conversations. Um, and I think that most would welcome uh, more opportunities to have um, workshops and discussion meetings and to come together and to talk about shared issues and, and, um, frustrations and opportunities and ways forward and and that they are because they're so actively working on it and drawing up policies to share policy just terminologies um there's lots of ways they could really benefit from that contact but don't necessarily have it although they often referred to localized like regional groups where they had met with others and they had you know they had had useful um support from other institutions who were a bit further along the road than they were so it's not that it's not happening. It's just that we could perhaps usefully um, put a bit more uh, resources and investment or energy into to that being something that is is more more ever you know more prevalent, more more available. Yeah, thank you both. Um, that was really interesting. It was great to to hear so much about the project. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, I realised at the start. Um, when I introduced Hasan Pen, I didn't introduce myself. Um, so my name's Roz, I'm the project coordinator for um, both Meteor and Star Projects. Um, and we are now gonna be um, talking about the Meteor project. So I'm gonna hand over to Robbie, my colleague. Cheers, Roz. So yeah, my name's Robbie Clark. I'm a postdoc working on the Meteor project. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, Meteor is basically looking at the ways in which meta research is being used or perhaps could be used better in decision making around enhancing research culture. So that's primarily in the context of uh, universities. So a quick overview of the talk, I'm gonna start by giving you um, a brief outline of our project goals and the desired impact that we'd like to have, and then really quickly talk about the methodology, but mainly we'll be talking about the preliminary themes that we've extracted from the data. So the first one of those which I'll talk through is a kind of broad contextual overview of how institutions have been making decisions about research culture. And within that, we'll be talking about the ways in which evidence and research evidence is used. Then the next thing which Ros will take you through is the enablers and barriers to meta research impact. Finally, just very quickly, we'll talk about um, what we see as the need for collaboration um, within the sector in order to like meaningfully move the dial on research culture. Um, and just very, very quickly at the end to tee you up for any future work that is coming out of our um, team. 
So to start off then, we've got multiple goals, but these three are really, as I say, kind of the most important and impact driven. So the first goal from our project is to identify pathways and barriers to meta research impacting on decision making around research culture. And so what we're trying to do is maximize the impact of existing meta research by strengthening the links between research evidence and decision making. And finally, we're hoping to kind of foster a cross institutional culture of collaboration over competition. So in other words, as a sector, we would like to promote people working together in order to improve research culture rather than trying to be competitive between institutions. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, we've got incredibly broad definitions of research culture and meta research. Um, so just to lean on the Royal Society's definition of research culture, we see it encompassing behaviors, values, expectations, attitudes, and norms of research communities. So in essence, it's just the culture, um, the, the culture of any context within research is occurring. And then meta research, again, super broad definition. We conceptualize this as any kind of research on the research process itself or researchers. So super quick overview of the methodology. It's, um, like starts so a qualitative project. We've conducted 19 interviews and one focus group. And so far we've interviewed 15 decision makers. And so these are all decision makers within English universities, quite senior people who've been making decisions around research culture. And then we've also looked at the question from a slightly different angle and interviewed seven meta researchers. In total, we've interviewed people from across 15 institutions, and these are varied in terms of the size of the institution, how research intensive they are. And 12 institutions are ones in which, um, sorry, of the 15 decision makers, they were distributed across 12 institutions. So then diving straight into the data. Um, first, I'm going to talk to you a bit about how institutions are making decisions around research culture, and then we'll go through the enablers and barriers to meta-research impact. So we've been thinking about how institutions are making decisions around research culture through this kind of combi behavior change model. So we're thinking about it in terms of institutions actually changing their behavior to pursue improvements to research culture. And the combi model stipulates that there are three things that are needed in order for behavior change to occur, both the capability, opportunity, and motivation. And we found that this framework is quite a helpful way for communicating and digesting the information that we've um, accrued through these interviews. So capability is things like the knowledge and the skills that you need in order to engage in a behavior. Then opportunity are the factors which actually enable it to happen, um, you know, resource, that sort of thing. And lastly, of course, motivation, there's both intrinsic and extrinsic factors, and these can all influence uh, decision-making and behavior. So what we found is really the crux of the matter, the sort of key combination, is that you have a particular person pushing for research culture change in a context that's receptive to that change. So in terms of the capability, what we found is that it's really important for there to be a motiv motivated individual or individuals who of very often have domain expertise in a specific area of research culture, and they're really pushing for that sort of change. But then that has to be coupled with actual opportunity. So in this case, it's very often in the receptive context. For example, senior management are being receptive to the kind of things that they're advocating for. And then thirdly, there's a heap of different kinds of motivation. That's you know at the individual level, at the institutional level. And there are all sorts of factors there that we'll talk a bit about later. So capability in terms of these individuals is very often the kind of indirect route that meta research reaches decision making. So at the minute, I, I've just described these kind of um, advocates, these research culture champions. And this wonderful quote here illustrates the way in which research evidence kind of percolates in through people's expertise at the moment, rather than explicitly. And so this is kind of one of the main channels at which we've seen research evidence coming through to decision making. It's far from direct, it's far more just relying on the experiences and the expertise of motivated individuals. And so that's where we've seen institutions that have had quite a lot of um, change within research culture is because they've got these pockets of expertise, for example, individuals or groups, and very often these people are actually specializing in the topics. And so they're very motivated and research informed. Um, so for example, some of the interviewees we've had are people whose actual research topics are around things like EDI and research policy. And so then the kind of, yeah, a second aspect of capability is that institutions with sufficient resource are then appointing senior research culture roles. 
We've seen this happening across the sector, things like Dean of Research Culture, Vice Chancellors, those sorts of things. And these kind of people are really centralizing and unifying research culture efforts across these institutions. Um, and what this does is helps to give strategic direction to the institution's uh, decision-making around research culture and helps to do things like allocate funding towards research culture initiatives, but more importantly, their evaluation. And that there is the second aspect in which um, research evidence is playing into decision-making in a big way. And that's what I've described as sort of in-house meta-research. And so from the people we interviewed, we found a lot of this is both ongoing and in the pipeline. And this is generally utilizing institutional expertise, um, but also we've seen people outsourcing it as well. And so contracting people to run evaluations on research culture. Um, and so just quickly here, you can see how resource affords opportunity. Thinking about the combi model, it's not just about the capability in the institution, but also the opportunity that's afforded by actually having sufficient resource, either to buy out people's time if you've got that um, expertise already within the institution, or conversely, if you're outsourcing it, you still need to be able to afford that. And so, for example, the kinds of in-house meta-research we've seen so far, um, some of you might have had these kind of things within your institution, kind of climate surveys. And so these are things like gathering data on researchers' needs and ideas through workshops and surveys. So that's evaluating the current climate. Um, but also on a more quantitative level, looking at things like the different kinds of ideas that people are submitting to internal funding schemes. And then also the demographic characteristics of people who are both applying and then also the outcomes of those internal funding schemes. So that's just a few examples of the kind of meta research that's going on. What I would say one of the key findings is that a lot more of this stuff is planned rather than actually happening at this stage. And that's where what a lot of people have talked about or decision makers specifically are these kind of feedback loops where at this stage it's more evaluating the current climate and implement, using that to implement certain research culture initiatives. But then there's a huge push and desire to evaluate initiatives a lot more in the future. And then of course that will create a feedback loop through which to understand which initiatives are working, what to pursue further and so forth. So having talked about capability, now we're moving on to the opportunity, the second key aspect of behavior change. Um, and yeah, obviously one of the most important enabling factors is that you've got sufficient resource to do so. Um, so that obviously varies across uh, institutions. And we saw that was a big aspect of um, you know, differences in interviewees was, you know, this is the amount of resource you have to this stuff is often a function of the research intensity and the things like the size of your institution and also the amount of QR funding that you get from the government. External funders were also a huge enabling factor. So many of you might be aware of Research England's enhancing research culture funding. These pots of money have been allocated to universities anywhere between 50,000 to a million pounds to both implement research culture initiatives and also evaluate them. So you think that's an enormous amount of opportunity afforded there by that money. And similar things have happened from, you know, Welcome Trust specific funding bids that are about um, improving research culture. And so that those opportunities are the things that we've seen then kind of intertwining to create these research culture roles and teams spawning research culture initiatives and then running this sort of institutional meta-research. On top of that, another kind of enabling factor, which is also an aspect of capability, is what we've seen is cross-institutional collaboration. So some of you might be familiar with networks such as the GW4 or the N8. These are kind of networks of universities or in the case of ARMA, you know, professional services. And what they do is they've been sharing a lot of knowledge and existing initiatives around research culture. So of course that sharing expertise is an aspect of capability, but also it's an opportunity because if someone, let's say you're within the N8 and Newcastle develop a kind of initiative, if they just share that information freely, then that massively lowers the cost of uptake because you haven't got to go and reinvent the wheel. You can utilize the information they've provided and run it at your institution. And so, yeah, this is this slide here is just to emphasize just how important opportunity is and also how it's a function of resource. So this first quote is quite stark, really, that this individual, this decision maker felt that the strategic imperative for research culture wouldn't come about unless Research England put the funding forward. Um, and then thinking about disparities between larger and smaller institutions, we can see this um, second quote here, someone describing how they've done some work. Uh, a lot of work on three concordats, which they think that they can support. 
but there are so many concordats and they're such a small institution that they have to evaluate which ones that they're able to do and which aren't going to be too much of a burden. Um, so finally then, <clears throat> sorry, moving on to the motivation aspect of the combi model. Um, here are just loads of different factors that we found both intrinsic and extrinsic, things which motivated both individuals and also institutions to make change about research culture. Um, so it won't surprise you that financial motivators were a big part here. So too was REF, um, particular people talking about the people, environment and culture announcement in REF 29. But then also things like Concordats, you know, DORA, Kawara, these sorts of things which have signed up to as an institution. Um, and then more kind of, I don't know, social aspects, things like peer pressure. So cross institutional peer pressure almost, um, not wanting to be left behind or seem like everyone else is doing something that you're not. Um, and of course, the advocates for change have been a huge motivating factor. And these individuals, not only are they governed by, you know, research evidence, but they've also very often research culture initiatives are driven by a kind of moral imperative to do the right thing. And also theoretical beliefs that something is the right thing, even when the evidence or data hasn't necessarily proven that yet. So on that note, we've got a quick Menti poll, which um, Roz is going to take you through. Um, and so I'll hand over to Roz now. Thank you, Ravi. Um, yeah, so I hope uh, you guys know how to use Menti or have used it before. You can just scan this QR code, should take you um, to the site or at the top of the screen that you can go to menti.com and type in that code um, and uh, it will take you to the right site. So what we want you to do is those um, eight influences on decision making that um, Robbie just uh, taught you through. Go to Menti and rank these in order of the ones which you think have the biggest influence on decision makers at your institution. Um, so what things do you think um, are making them make decisions about, about research culture? So I will give you a few minutes to do that. And then we'll have a look at the results. And also, I'd say that if you have any questions about what we mean by things like moral imperative, if you'd like more examples, please just post them in the chat. And it's completely anonymous. We can't see what you said. I'll just give you another minute. Okay, so hopefully I click show results. So we've got a question about um, an example of theoretical beliefs. Um, so that would be something like, um, you know, a kind of a rational argument for why something makes sense. So, for example, in EDI space, very often people say that, um, you know, by increasing diversity, that implicitly will come to better outcomes. And that's grounded in, um, you know, a set of beliefs which may or may not currently have evidence backing them up. I don't actually yeah. know. I'm sure there is. Well, thank you for completing that. So we can see um, financial uh, motivators and ref, uh, uh, along with the senior adv advocate for change, are the top three coming out of that. Um, and then uh, poor meta research down at the bottom, uh, not having much influence. Um, so yeah, th thank you for that. That's, that's interesting to see where things. Uh, where things fall and that um, this poll actually kind of agrees with what we heard, heard quite a lot in our interviews. So I will go through that now. So talking about funders, um, as we can see from the poll, um, people seem to agree with the fact that funders and funding um, really can dictate the priorities of an institution and can um, dictate where does, how and where decisions are made. I think this the, this quote at the top, um, want, if, if funders want to see a greater emphasis on research culture and applications, that clearly drives university behaviour. Um, so just highlighting that point again. Um, and the way that the mechanism through which that works um, is highlighted quite well by, by this uh, second quote from a meta researcher, researcher talking about the MRC, but you can insert any kind of funding um, body or ref or whatever into that. Um, if they stipulate that they need to see improving diversity, then people are going to demonstrate that they've committed to improving diversity 
because if they don't, then they're not going to give us as much money. And that really, um, really links into both opportunity and motivation and kind of sits in the in the um, overlap between those. Um, if, if funders want to see research culture improvements, it happens um, because it's such a key motivator. We all know that without without funding, research won't happen. But it also creates the opportunity for that research culture change. And that financial motivation can then lead to that receptive context, like Robbie was mentioning earlier, um, where you need a, a motivated individual in a context that is receptive to that. Without funding, that com that context isn't going to be receptive. Breath, similarly to to the poll, came out as um, a key a key kind of driver for for shaping the research cultural priorities. Um, highlighted here by you know, ref obviously is a factor because it's a competition with a cash prize. So linking straight back into that um, funding being a real key driver of research culture change and also kind of achieving more funding. Um, and again, a meta researcher bringing up, once ref said things needed to be open access, the university was chasing for that. So it kind of shows that um, funders and ref and QR funding really are kind of um, providing a lot of the kind of impetus for change in research culture. And it looks like that is kind of going to increase as we go from REF 2021 to REF 2029. However, um, there is a real sense that universities were already going down this path. There was already desire to improve research culture. The direction of travel was um, going in the right way. So for example, this quote, uh, um, this is someone who's in a um, in a research culture position. I was well in post before research England confirmed the enhancing weighting for culture in the next ref, ref exercise. And this next one, I don't think Ref 29 has radically changed what we're doing, it's just sharpened our focus. So there's this real sense that people had recognized that there was a problem and we're moving towards um, kind of moving in the right direction. But Ref can just provide a really big lever for those people who are motivated individuals in a decision making um, with decision making responsibility they can really pull on those to get um, EDCs or, or whoever to, um, uh, to to really create change in their institution but it is not all about the money we identified um, lots of different reasons why um, institutions make decisions about research culture and why they want to improve things which fall into the kind of evidential, moral, theoretical um, uh, area. We identified lots of different types of evidence um, that make their way into decision making. Some being as simple as, um, particularly around things like EDI and open research, just um, kind of face value evidence. I walk around my department and I see there's a lack of diversity. I know there's a problem. I don't need um, kind of a long research project to say there's a problem. What are we going to do about it? So that kind of experience um, and face value evidence making its way in. Also things like internal data, so that might be from HR or from repositories, um, that kind of data laying the groundwork for, dis for decisions to improve research culture. We also saw people looking at internal or external reports um, and also people actually occasionally looking at the meta research evidence, but that was um, in the occasion where you had that senior advocate for change, who was someone who was really plugged into the meta research community and could be that um, kind of path from, there's a meta research group here doing really interesting research on you know, insert area, um, EDI funding partnerships, whatever. Uh, and they being that person being that conduit to get that evidence into the um, onto the agenda at uh, decision making meetings. Also, a real um, a real sense of a desire to do the right thing came out of our, our interviews. Um, a lot of the people working in the research culture space know that they need to pull the funding levers and the ref levers, but their kind of their individual motivation comes from a desire to do the right thing, uh, and they know kind of the strings they have to pull, but it's kind of coming from the right place. There's also, as Robbie was saying, uh, the theoretical um, side of it. So where there's beliefs that are maybe untested or lack evidence, but um, people have a desire to, to create change. So moving on to um, kind of the second key theme we, we've identified, 
Um, they enablers and barriers to uh, research evidence in decision making, but meta research impact. So a lot of these enablers and barriers we've found um, in some, they're kind of balanced. In some cases, they're a barrier. In some cases, they're an enabler. And the same thing, um, looking at the flip side of the same thing, can um, be both a barrier and an enabler. So for example, lack of time and funding is a key barrier and short-term contracts. If a meta researcher is working on a project for two years, they once they move on to something else, they don't necessarily have that time and money to to follow up on on how that um, piece of research has um, has had impact. Also, this idea of limited evidence versus the magnitude of the proposed change. Um, so I have a I have a quote to demonstrate this in a bit easier English in the um, the next slide, but that's kind of the idea that um, if you're trying to get someone to make a huge systematic change, and you've done a one-year research project, um, maybe that isn't enough evidence to convince those people to make that huge change. But you need the resource to do the big research project. And if you can only get it for a small thing, then that's what you're stuck with. On the flip side of that, um, we've heard lots about these um, people who are in research culture roles. Um, and these people do have time. They do have funding. They have been given time and funding from their institution to work specifically on research culture um, and work on research culture projects. So there, um, they can devote, yeah, devote their time, time and resources. Often people on stable contracts are then able to follow up um, with their meta research in um, like subsequent years or um, kind of continue to promote it over, over the long term. We've also seen um, funder interest and engagement as a key enabler. So this means when, um, uh, when a funder kind of directs the, the research question or has some kind of guidance in um, the research project whilst it's being developed, if you've already got that buy-in, um, then that route to impact is a much clearer pathway because there's already people interested in hearing what you've got to say. So as I said, this, this um, quote kind of exemplifies the, the disparity between um, the size of research projects that are being done and, and uh, the amount of change people want to make. So saying that, you know, if you have a million pounds uh, economic research project, um, but you want to change things that are talking about the billions, then people say, well, that's not enough evidence for us to for us to change. So again, on these kind of balanced enablers and barriers, um, we have the way organisations or institutions are structured. So enablers. Um, such as this advocates, these senior motivated individuals who um, are often in research culture roles, who are in the right place, they're in the right meetings, um, and they are listened to about research culture. Um, so that's a key enabler, having this, these advocates, um, especially where, um, in terms of meta research, they um, are linked into a research group or the meta research literature, Often that's just in their specific area, but they provide a real key route um, to get this better research um, onto decision makers' uh, agendas. That kind of um, is related to the research roles or groups. Um, so that's the um, these senior motivated individuals again. And then connections and networks. Um, this can be between different institutions. Um, so where you have, like Robbie mentioned, N8 or Guild HE or ARMA, um, these kind of inter, inter uh, cross-institutional groups, um, they can be a way, like if a piece of meta research is picked up by them, that can be, get spread quite quickly, but also networks within institutions. Um, so people who are particularly interested in, for example, open research, if you get enough mass of that, then they can kind of start to um, have impact on the, on the agenda. Some barriers which come about from, from organizational structure. Um, so I don't think it'll be a surprise to anyone, but um, lots of universities have very ingrained hierarchies. Um, and that means if you're an early career researcher um, looking into maybe bullying harassment in, in HE, you might not have the, the prestige or the reputation um, to get more senior people to listen to you. Um, and that kind of ingrained hierarchy can be a, a real barrier for meta researchers. Um, there can also be resistance to culture change, um, which means that um, that 
research just can't have the impact that is, that is desired. And then there are also these contextual and cultural differences within institutions. Um, so one department might have a very different research culture to start with and very different research culture problems than you know the one that's in the building opposite them. Um, and that can really impact on how one piece of research can, can, can happen. We also have the speed at which large institutions change, which is quite slowly. Um, and again, if you have um, more um, like junior ECRs um, doing the research, they might not be around in, in, in one institution um, to be able to see that piece of change that, uh, that they worked in kind of come to fruition. And evolved administration links back to those kind of cultural differences between departments. But there are some pretty other barriers to impact. So things totally outside the sector's control, pandemics, changing governments, laws. We had people um, talking about wanting to um, put EDI initiatives in that would involve positive discrimination and coming up with real um, barriers uh, with kind of legal departments of universities. Um, there's also a sense that findings from MESA research done within an institution can be taken personally, um, and that can stop them being accepted in that institution um, because people kind of don't want to risk reputational damage to, to themselves, or they might just disagree with the findings on a, an individual level. There is also a barrier which comes from the novelty of the field. Uh, there's a sense that people don't necessarily know exactly what meta research is. Um, it doesn't have kind of established um, kind of groups or journals. Um, so this kind of lack of an established pathway that goes between the meta research and the decision maker. And um, that, that hasn't kind of been fully fleshed out yet. So I will hand back to Robbie. Cheers, Ros. Um, yeah, so what I've done in this slide is really just to try and summarize what we thought of as the key pathways to help maximize the impact of uh, meta research. So obviously sufficient funding is really key, but also something that we observed a number of times is actually having co-created or impact-driven research questions. So these are situations in which either the funders or potentially decision makers have been actively engaged and involved in designing the research questions and the subsequent methodologies to address that. And so what that does is ensures that A, the research has impact kind of baked into it from the heart out offset, B, that it's really directly relevant to people for whom it's meant to be intended, and also there's a, then a predetermined pathway to impact where you've got stakeholders who are really already knowledgeable about the project and are interested in utilizing the evidence and getting it to inform research culture. So that's really crucial there. And if that's not the case, at least having links between the research team and institutional decision makers. So, for example, in the institutions where there was a dean of research culture, Actually, that person was very often plugged into meta research communities and potentially even directly involved in certain research projects. So that individual obviously has a seat at the high level decision making table within the institution. And so establishing those sorts of links between met the meta research communities through, for example, senior individuals can really help um, to increase the reach and impact. And lastly, the kind of wider networks that we saw, things like the GW4 and N8 those sorts of networks of people with shared goals, sharing expertise and um, ideas. It's another way to kind of broaden the reach of meta research. So just a, a final note then on collaboration. Um, thinking back to when Roz mentioned earlier that, you know, the REF is a competition with a cash prize. Um, and we saw this from a meta researcher as well, who kind of said that they were slightly worried within the research culture sphere that since the announcement of um, people, culture and environment being you know, included in the REF, that they're worried that it's put people more in competition, whereas previously they found that things were very collaborative. Um, and for us, this is really striking and really important because as you can see from the second quote that came from a decision maker, they felt that we really have to collaborate as a sector if we're going to move the dial on this. In other words, there is such the remit of research culture is so broad. There are so many different aspects to it that we can't all be specialists in every aspect of research culture. If we tried to do that, I think would be some or some someone said sorry that would be spreading the jam too thin. And so this is where adopting a you know sector wide culture of collaboration is going to be really important because um, even though things might need to be adapted or tweaked for individual contexts, 
if people can at least, if certain institutions can at least specialize in certain aspects of research culture and then share those things, we stop people from reinventing the wheel. Um, so just to kind of summarize what we've talked about so far, we've um, used the combi model to kind of contextualize our understanding of how uh, research culture change is occurring in UK or specifically English universities at this stage. Um, and so we've noted the importance of both research culture advocates, but also these key enabling factors such as, you know, high level decision makers within institutions and then also the resource to do so. And we've identified many motivators. Obviously, funding is a really key enabler and motivator, but also there's a really wide range of evidence that's coming into the decision making space. Um, and at some levels, that's actually research evidence, whether that's published meta research or institutional um, research. But that goes all the way down to very informal lines of evidence like personal experience. And I think that's the key or one of the key things here is actually a lot of the evidence that comes in is sort of embodied in the sense that everyone doing the research, everyone within the institutions is a researcher. And so we all are all part of the research culture. Um, and so everyone brings their own kind of understanding to the table. Um, and then thinking about the ways in which we can maximize research impact um, or meta research impact on decision making. So one thing is the importance of impact led projects, designing projects with impact in mind, um, trying to engage relevant parties and co-create research with them. And then also trying to establish bigger links between researchers and institutional decision makers. So, you know, not just through things like these kind of Dean for research culture roles, but also just trying to put meta, meta researchers within institutions in contact with people. Um, so across all career stages. So just finally then to tee you up for some future work that we're doing. So this Meteor project is then going to fuel um, our next project, which is funded by the Wellcome Trust called Comet. So Comet is going to be based at the universities of Bristol and Sussex, and it's really building on Meteor and expanding. So thus far, we've only interviewed decision makers from English universities, and we're going to expand that to look at um, all universities across the UK. And so part of Meteor then is going to be putting a detailed plan together for how we're going to address this and scale up with Comet. Um, and also we've got a co-creation workshop planned in the autumn. So that's going to really help us to, you know, take our key preliminary findings to stakeholders and get their ideas and feedback to help give us more focused research questions that we're going to pursue in Comet. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you to these um, funders who have funded the Meteor project. And um, yeah, we've got 20 minutes, thankfully, to get some questions. So we've had a question already from Vicky. Um, did you get a sense that institutional decision makers are directly connecting improvement in research culture to improvement in overall research quality as a long term goal when they're making decisions about investing in research culture interventions? Now, my initial thought is um, not that much. Um, it came up occasionally, um, but the kind of real drives for um, for improving research culture didn't tend to be linked to improving the quality of the research done. It was more about um, improving the environment for their staff, getting more funding in and kind of having a better a better place in the ref. But there was also coming through clearly that kind of um, sense that um, people thought felt like this was the right thing to do. So maybe we just kind of didn't ask the right question um, to kind of dig into that properly. Um, but yeah, we, it, it didn't come up that much. Okay, thanks very much. If anyone else has any other questions, just put them in the chat or, or um, unmute and, and ask them in person. Okay, I will um, butt in with a question while others are thinking. Um, I'm interested in what kind of meta research data has the kind of impact that has the potential to drive the, uh, this, like, to, the, yeah, is, is there a quality or a kind, like meta research data is broad. Um, I, I, I would like a sense of the areas where it's really is useful and has been, you know, can be shown to be useful and that, that people maybe bring up or, or, 
are we needing to 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 hear more of those examples in order to make some progress the first thing that springs to my mind is when people have described the sort of in-house meta research that they're doing and the reason that seemed to be particularly useful in sort of driving culture change is because people within in universities is very um they, they tend to be quite data driven or at least this was the perspective of interviewees and so there's a sense that if you've got hard data for example on a certain cultural issue within your institution that that's kind of indisputable although people might try but um you know you can put that on the table and so that's where yeah, the kinds of meta research that are most likely to improve things very often are things that are directly investigating the current culture within your institution. Um, I don't know if Rose has got anything to add on that. I don't think so. I think said what I would have said. So from Tom. Have you engaged at all with the literature on academic capitalism? There's a whole body of research about the tensions between financial incentives and traditional academic drivers, i.e. moral theoretical issues, and how these influence organisational policy structure priorities. This might enhance your analysis a bit. A good starting point would be and a link. Thank you very much, Tom. That looks really helpful. Um, I don't know if you've looked at any of that, Robbie. No, I've not. That looks really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm interested in the idea that, and just, just riffing, but on the idea that there's a tension between the financial incentives and traditional academic drivers, kind of the moral and theoretical, because, I mean, so far with what we've seen, it's very often, I mean, going back to, you know, some of the slides that Roz presented, what funders are doing and mandating or kind of aligns with the moral and theoretical in this sense, you know, it's people saying you need to include this in order to get grant funding um and it kind of aligns with the kind of the moral argument say that you know edi is good or reforming research assessment is good um so yeah i'm very curious to see where the kind of tension arises i've got, got a question from marta yeah. uh, do you think it makes sense to explore more specific sub elements of research culture through your model so wouldn't there be differences between EDI and data openness, for example. I think that is definitely true. And there's very different differing um, amounts of uh, research evidence in the different elements of, of research culture, which we, um, we kind of have some data on. We haven't really kind of dug down into that yet. Um, but it's a... Yeah, it's something that we we definitely can explore and we have noticed that it depended on the example that the interviewer was giving as to kind of the data that they would be using or the research evidence that they would be using to uh, kind of demonstrate that. So it's definitely a good point. Yeah, it kind of reflects the idea that research culture as an umbrella term is a kind of a newer um, concept, but actually a lot of this stuff has been going on for a long time. And so there are very established communities of research into things like EDI, whereas some of the other um, you know, UK, I have like nine dimensions of research culture. Some of the others have a much like smaller amount of evidence currently accrued for them. And so people did dis discuss that um, and how, you know, that the amount of existing evidence obviously influences the extent to which evidence plays a role in decision making. Um, so, yeah, really, really good observation. But also the availability of that evidence or the, the prominence of that that evidence so do, do people know it exists um varies quite a lot between the different um yeah sub elements of research culture simon you've raised your hand great sorry i thought i'd ask a question in person rather than just typing everything into the chat because it gets a bit impersonal otherwise um yeah so 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 firstly thank you it was really interesting and um i was involved from the university of portsmouth with getting some of the funding together for the for this project so obviously have an interest um so i think Absolutely agree with what it was Robbie, I think it was just said about research culture being a sort of umbrella term and includes lots of other components. And in fact, what some people refer to as integrity and others refer to as reproduci 
reproducibility and others refer to misconduct all kind of come under that culture thing and people are just using different names for the same sort of thing. And thus, to what extent are you taking the data that you have found from your interviews and then relating it back to all these other um, reports that are out there. And I, th I think particularly of the um, Vitae um, Research Landscape um, report that myself and, and Marcus were involved with a couple of years ago, which although not called research culture, covers very much the same things. And I just wonder whether or not it might be worth referring back to some of those early reports. I mean, the Wellcome Trust um, report on bullying is another example as well. Um, and just seeing whether or not the data that you've got sort of relates to some of those other previous reports, but under different names. Yeah, definitely. That sounds like a great way to kind of, I guess, contextualize. I'd say going back to some of your methodological comments as well, I think at, th at this stage, we're still, you know, these are very much preliminary themes. We've only really started getting into the analysis um, over, you know, like the last sort of month or so. And so we're trying at this stage to be very much directed by the research questions that we've set out with, and now using that to kind of look more inductively at the interesting ideas that are emerging from the data themselves. But then this component that you're describing of, you know, looking at existing literature and bringing that back in, that's going to be hugely important in the next steps. So, um, yeah, any resources or things that you can share with us would be really appreciated. I, I, oh, go on. <laughs> just, um, yeah, just it, it's a big question and not one that I expect you to um, be able to answer, but uh, I wonder if others have comments on it as well. It's just this idea that um, the ultimate research culture, you know, the, the, I think it was on one of your first slides, you know, that we want to break down the barriers between institutions. And it's it's like a, that is a major, major shift. Um, I know we do lots of interdisciplinary work. I know we work with, you know, we love working with colleagues in different institutions, but in terms of the way that the whole system is structured and the financial models in that, the branding, the, the history, that there's all sorts of things which make that feel like a very huge culture change. And I say that as, as someone who's been thinking in relation to the open research data culture, which also has potentially something much bigger than just we're all doing making our data openly accessible you know there is a vision of a future where that has profound impacts on the way that we hold knowledge and the way that um and, and who that knowledge is available to and how institutions then function and might want to cooperate so but we don't really talk about that goal that's like way ahead in terms of the the journey um and i just wondered how you feel about the meta research in relation to that kind of those kind of vast research culture changes you know is that is that is that the ideal is that really the journey we're on or are we doing it you know when we're talking to institutions I feel like that is that's we're talking within an institutional realm which is still very embedded in something quite different from that yeah I, I think the 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 scale of the research project to answer kind of that question is is just so enormous that it, it kind of has to be done in this in this kind of small broken down ways um that kind of all lead towards some kind of greater change in the future i guess um yeah don't know if you have anything to add robbie no i don't think so i think yeah that sums it up really um yeah only that it would be interesting to see where comet can kind of feed into that and address those sorts of aspects a bit more but um again it just yeah it comes down to feasibility I guess and I guess speaks back again to that kind of um the capitalism versus other values kinds of models of what's driving this you know how how much are we pinned to these kinds of big ideals and how realistic is that what is that really the journey we're on or are we locked into a much more academic capitalism um version of this story and and that like that um quote of ref is a competition with a cash prize, but also in that same sentence, that person recognized the need for collaboration. And how do you incentivize collaboration when at the end of the day people are in competition? Um, I think that's quite an interesting question. Um, yeah. 
I think that stuff really highlights for me as well the importance of this kind of work, not to to our own horn, but you know the the idea that we you know the, the kind of data that we're generating here, not that it's necessarily su super novel, but just getting people's voices into the into the arena and published that people are really worried about the ways in which PCE might have this adverse consequence, um, but that could potentially shape the ways in which it is measured um, in order to possibly you know move models to try and make it a more equitable landscape and to move models away from the academic uh, sort of capitalist framework and actually yeah push the down more meaningfully by um, understanding ways in which probably through both carrots and sticks we change the landscape to be more collaborative um, and you know potentially make it rewarding to be more collaborative. Oh. Okay. If there's no more questions, then I think we will finish there. Um, thank you very much for everyone for attending. If you do have any last minute questions, type them in now whilst we're, whilst we're still about. Um, or you can um, reach us by email and I'll, I'll put our email in the chat. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for attending. Thanks so much.